nice to see all the smiling faces. Is, isn't Pinball Expo fun? Everybody having a great time? Yeah. I saw, is Rob Burke still in the room? Rob Burke was sitting over here, this poor guy, and he slept through most of the last seminar. It's exhausting. It's just an exhausting few days, but it's it's some of the most fun days of the whole year that we get to spend with each other. Um, a lot of us don't get to see each other for the whole year. Maybe we just see each other on social media, and it's a great event. You know, it goes, it really goes beyond pinball. That brings us together, but we're really a big extended family, a little dysfunctional, wacky family, but everybody's really nice. Um, before I begin this evening, we had a um, we had a factory tour contest, and there was a chance to win a signed Avatar playfield that's signed by the entire design team. And the question was, how many LEDs are in an Avatar CE? And somebody actually answered 1,005. The correct number is 1,019. So the winner had a win by not going over the amount of LEDs. You know, Steve's got a game. I don't know how many LEDs. I lost track after 1,000. So the winner, if he's present, Dan Verbeke. Guess not. Okay, well, I'm going to call Dan after, and I'll tell him that he won, and he can pick it up. So thank you for that. Tonight, um, we get to see a little bit more from the design team that created this amazing game, Avatar. And you see it, it's beautiful. Did, it, did everybody actually get a chance to play Avatar? What do you think about the game? This guy, it's his first game. First game. And, and, and Mark is going to introduce everybody because he's the captain, but he's an artist. How many pinball machines did you do before? Zero. Zero. Amazing. Sound guy. How many pinball machines did you do? Zero. Let's bring him into the project. Now, this is where I get, this is where I get screwed up because... JP, bless his heart, has been with us since the beginning. So our animations and his art direction, nobody has games that look like our games. I mean, I'm a little partial. I am Jersey Jack. Uh, they're just playable works of art. Since The Wizard of Oz was in the Smithsonian years ago, just magnificent. We keep Somehow JP and the team keeps out doing themselves. So uh, thank you. And Olaf. <laughs> thank you. Keith, uh, I've said it before, uh, one of the rocks that I built the company on, really. Just can't, can't say enough good things about Keith and, and how he, what he brings to games. Who else? We got Rachel. Rachel. You worked on before. Zero. Rachel worked on zero. I don't want to block her. Jason, programming, software. How many pinball machines have you worked on? Second one. Elton was my Elton was your first one. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Seiden right now, the game designer. Hello. By the way, Aaron, thank you for being Mark's tester and being there with him. Mark has, in creating this game, it really was blood, sweat, and tears. Because I saw blood, I saw sweat, and I saw tears. So he really went through the whole gamut. And he left his whole heart in this game. And thank you for doing that, you and your team. Thank you. Congratulations. We missed one person. We missed Taylor on the end. <laughs> Exactly. 
So my name is Mark Seiden. I'm lead uh, game designer on Avatar The Battle for Pandora. Um, we did have some slides to show you the progress and development that we went through um, over this past two and a half years on this project. Um, so uh, start with uh, playfield stuff. Um, so here's the first white wood ever that we cut. Um, no inserts. Things are in weird spots, things like that. Like it's starting to, it's, you can still see the windows. I don't think we changed those at all during the development process. The, those windows stayed the same shape and same position. But started to build it up. Um, we didn't actually have lower play fields on the first um, version of uh, our first Whitewood. Um, and there's all sorts of differences going on here, like um, that loop back ramp, you notice it's um, way too small. <laughs> um, that was a mistake. Um, and uh, we're using, on the second picture, you can start to see we're using like Elton parts and um, trying to figure out like the, um, what became the upper left loop. Um, it still has like uh, big targets on the right, and um, we're st and the scramp wasn't even really in the game at this time. I knew it was going to be there, but the mech hadn't been developed yet. Um, so then we moved on, build it up even more. This is Whitewood Two. Um, now we have lower play field. Um, I'm figuring out the um, the left side, um, the, which became the. Uh, the RDA ramp, um, so, you, so you can see the big blue uh, 3D printed um, ball guide, which where we're trying to figure out where's the right place to drop this ball in front of this flipper to make it work. Um, the, the one on the left is actually all um, wire forms that I made myself. <laughs> um, some of them came out pretty good, some of them came out pretty bad. If you look at the one on the left, um, the kickback one, it's uh, in rough shape. I'm using a Godfather up kicker um, just to s make the up kicker work. Um, and, um, and then on the right, we've got some uh, actual manufactured sample parts going on. The up kicker looks right. And you can notice that um, the sculpt on the right um, is different from what went to production. Uh, we were originally going to put a, a Talcoon um uh, sculpt there. That's uh, the whale creatures from the second movie. Um, but ultimately, we went in a different direction. Um, but at this point, we had the scramp in there and proved out that that awesome jump shot would work. Um, we still have the, the narrow um, uh, loopback ramp, um, which was um, took a little, little time to t get right. As you can see here, uh, there were 10 different <laughs> versions <laughs> before I got it right. Um, that, that was fun. <laughs> um, but in the end, you can hit that, uh, that ramp from three different flippers. Um, so you can hit it from both left flippers and the lower right flipper. Um, it turned out that th th it was worth, worth going through this process to get it right. Um, after a while, we started getting um, programming done, um, starting adding more sculpts. Um, we see the prototype uh, amp suit over here. We called him the Cheese Man. Um, he was very low poly, uh, blocky thing like that. Um, we had the uh, we switched over to the Elu, uh, the McFarland sculpt. Uh, we had the Banshee sculpt in there, uh, and we had our prototype uh, Floating Mountains which um, didn't have the waterfall on it yet. It didn't have some of the details. Um, uh, all those, um, the, there's two McFarland sculpts, the Banshee and the Elu. Um, the other sculpts we developed ourselves um, from actual movie assets. Uh, we had, um, the, so Lightstorm gave us like movie quality assets. That they, they would drop like a five gig model of an amp suit. You could zoom in and see every bolt, every gear. Uh, and so, and like, we were like, we can't work with these. Can you please send us lower poly ones, please? <laughs> um, so this is a cool one. So we started, we needed to start testing UV inks. Uh, so we used the concept art we had at the time, uh, had a play field printed and with the blue background. And uh, there's actually UV inks on here, which totally different from the original. I don't have a picture of them, unfortunately. 
Um, like uh, the, the Navis, um, the UV inks, they, they got some war paint on their faces instead of the dots. Um, uh, then we, uh, the one on the right is pretty close to what we ended up with at the end. Um, there's still some differences in the lighting, the, the spotlights. Um, there's uh, some differences in some of the ramps, um, uh, but uh, 3D sculpts, we got the lower play fields pretty much the way we wanted them. Um, and it was, it was, uh, this is pretty close to the final game. And then this is the first uh, version of the, this is when we first powered up the, uh, the, the CE topper. Um, there's a few differences, if you notice. Uh, obviously, there's no art on it. Uh, but if you look behind Token Collected, there's a globe. Uh, originally, uh, the planet was the planet that uh, Pandora orbits around, Polythemus. Uh, we called it Blupiter, because uh, it was basically Blue Jupiter. Uh, and then we had a spinning Pandora over to the right. Uh, didn't quite work. Uh, that Pandora was scraping against the cockpit window. We couldn't make it fit in like get the wires in there right. Uh, we only have so much space to work with the topper. Uh, you know, because um, we ship with the uh, C, ship with the topper in the box uh, uh, installed. Uh, so it has to fit in the box. Uh, so we have a limited um, rectangle, uh, cube or rectangle uh, to work with. Um, so that ended up being scrapped. And that was a great decision, because uh, Pandora is really the star of the, uh, of, of the movies. So um, we took that out, uh, made it Pandora, and now it's the topper that you see today. And on the left here, that's the actual first game uh, off the line, um, ready on play, uh, play field test. Um, and that game shot beautifully. I, like, I was very happy with like it. It just came out great. Um, and on the right, that's the first game in a box. And that's the first game on location. Um, I wish I had a shot of it not being played, but I everyone kept playing it. So <laughs> um, there it is. All right. So that's that's it for my portion. Now I'm going to hand it off to Leah to talk about her art development. Hello. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you. It's very useful. Um, <laughs> um, hi, I'm Leah. Um, I made the art, as has been mentioned. Um, so <laughs> this is the sketch version of that last image, um, which is used for the back left. Um, so I, I start out pretty rough. I'm kind of just you know, laying things out. Oh, the scroll button works. Okay. <laughs> um, and as you can see, some things change in the, over the course of development. Sometimes that's my choice because things don't work as well as I think they will, or it's the, um, the client that's coming back and asking for changes, of course. Um, I had the little jellyfish <laughs> creatures coming up here, and um, instead we went with an elu at the end. Um, here is the back glass for the alternate version, and as you can see, this is also very different. And this on the left is a um, a scrapped concept that could have been on the uh, side art. And um, I did actually really like this composition, but I am very happy with what we ended up with. It's actually my favorite um, on the whole piece. And um, this obviously changed the. Three people are no longer there. It's no longer um, Jake Nateri and uh, how do you say her name again? Which did it? Kiri. Yes, Kiri. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and instead of these flying banshees over here, it is Jake and Nateri, as you see on the standard version. Here's the sketch version of the uh, side art. Um, not much actually changed here. I think the only thing that changed is that they requested the uh, three ships or some ships coming toward us they also wanted they really wanted to feature vehicles um, so uh, the ship was included 
and we got rid of the avatar of the side. It was surprising that they didn't want to throw their name around, but um, yeah, so the final mission does not have the avatar logo there. And here's the color rough version. You see the ships make their way in, um, but not much else really changed uh, from this point to what you see on the final machine. Um, here's also a comparison of the sketch and color rough versions of the um, side blade art. Um, you can see like the center area here changed uh, from the, is that the, that's the left? I always get them mixed up. <laughs> um, but the middle area changed. And um, because they, they, as I mentioned, they really wanted to feature their vehicles um, from the movie. And uh, of course, it I gave them what they wanted. <laughs> Here's the step-by-step, side-by-side from like sketch to final. Um, this is the one that we actually uh, ended up using instead of that first sketch. And I'm very happy with it. It's my favorite one out of all of them. So this one was pretty clean. I don't think anything changed from sketch to color to render. Um, so this one was pretty, pretty, you know, uh, just keep going. <laughs> and here's some more color roughs. This is the, uh, the left side art. Yeah. yeah. And as you can see here, we had um, the, uh, the leaders of the tribe in the Nakaina, yeah. yes. Um, and they didn't end up making it into the end. Um, we ended up replacing them, or just taking them out, and I filled it with um, another Banshee writer. And this is the sketch, the final composition that we ended up going with that replaced that first sketch that I shared initially for the back glass art. And as you can see here, the corners aren't stretched out um, with ropes as they are in the final. I think, JP, were you the one that ended up doing that with the ropes yeah. and stretching yeah. it out? Only on the uh, CE version. Only on the CE, okay. Cool. Well, thank you, JP. <laughs> uh, this is the, um, I'm blanking. The back panel. Thing. Back panel, thank you. Um, this is the back panel, this is the composition, little stick figure avatars <laughs> running across <laughs> <laughs> the branches there. So when I start, I'm mostly putting just layout down and then I make things on model and make them look right. Um, and here's the full sketch for the uh, play field, which was the first thing I did um, when starting this. and. Yeah, most of this stayed the same, um, except for the the low oops the lower play field here. Um, I had originally thought that um, maybe it could be the um, inside of the the whale's mouth, the yeah. um, Tolkien's mouth, mm -hmm. where you know they were harvesting the their life essence for eternal life on Earth. <laughs> um, but that ended up uh, changing in the end um, because that's where the, and it became a seal instead. Oh, am I not supposed to mention it? You can mention it. Okay, it's an Easter egg, look for it. It's <laughs> cute. <laughs> um, so most of this stayed the same. What, what was written on the front there? What did you say from the field? There's an otter. The otter. Oh. Yeah, there's the, the, the otter that didn't it's make so it into the movie, but it's in the, the yeah. deleted scenes and it's adorable and it's in the art book and I love it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that's there instead, and I'm very happy because it's very cute. Um, you can also see I sketched out at the bottom the anemones that, uh, in the second movie, Nataeum. yes, that Nataeum was, uh, let down into when, uh, he passed away. Uh, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh. I, I included those anemones in that spot because, you know, that's that's where your ball falls. And, you know, I thought it would be kind of like a nice nod to their, you know, traditional ways of like um, laying to rest their people. And, you know, your ball has also laid to rest, unfortunately. <laughs> but that didn't make it in. <laughs> it made it a little far, though. Is this just a zoom in? Is that? That doesn't look like what you had. Interesting. Okay. Gotta go back. Yeah. 
I don't know. Okay. Well, apparently we don't have any. Well, all right. <laughs> but you can kind of see oh, them yeah, down there. Yeah, yeah. The yellow anemones kind of just peeking out there, but they were um, they were there in the color phase. And yeah, they don't entirely quite look like themselves yet, but that's just how I work. Don't worry, I get it right in the end. Um, and this is the UV applied to the side blades, which it's just so cool to see all of that lit up. It's really cool. Um, I did not do that. <laughs> this was not me. This was Mark um, Molitor. Molitor. And here's another look. I love this. How the how the um oh come on the the to the Torak. Torak. I'm sorry. It's yeah. been a while since I've thought about. <laughs> it, there's a cool story about that. Um, yeah, talk about. So um, they've never actually shown that creature at night before. Um, so we, we needed references. They wanted all this bioluminescence to be perfect, like on movie, like the same. Um, so we asked them, well, what's the, the reference for that? And they're like, well, actually we've never shown that before. Um, but there was this video game that got canceled that we might've made a reference for. So we'll, um, send you that. So this is the first time you've ever seen like how that creature will glow in the dark. Um, it's never actually been shown in any of the movies. Which is really cool. Only from JJP. <laughs> <laughs> and here are all the plastics. Um, just crammed together in one sheet. Uh, easier for production. Um, and here on the right is how they look in UV versus um, standard lighting. And that's it's just so neat to see them side by side. And now we're on to screen UI development, which is JP. Is that my quote? Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, this, 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 this is on. Okay. Yes? Yeah, this is, this is good. Yeah, I just want to add to the whole art story that uh, including the UV, uh, it's a massive undertaking to add all the three colors of UV. So you just have to regular color art, but then all the pieces have the three colors of UV. Then uh, the, the development of uh, the UV lights, and, and so it's a massive undertaking to, to get and then get two games with different uh, patterns. Yeah, it's not different patterns, but the, the, so the LE is only with the blue ink, but then uh, you got to figure out which parts maybe not work with blue ink in, in let's say fire, um, so you have to take those out. But um, Leah was uh, uh, so Mark found Leah online uh, was a great uh, great find because uh, normally I look for uh, artists and uh, the way she filled in that play field with sketches. I didn't really have to to add uh, much of ideas. She did it m uh, most of it by herself. So it's it's really really I was really. Um, impressed by by what you what you did so it's uh, amazing um so uh screen ui development um and oh um yeah that's uh that's fine And I would like to add to that that she is the first female artist in pinball in 30 years. So that's cool. Um, so the UI development is always uh, a, a real, uh, yeah, long process. Um, most important are to show the rules of the game and rules develop over time. Um, and Keith had his this concept of the song chord modes, uh, which I, I, I it was so hard for me to understand what he really wanted to do with that. Um, but uh, so maybe Keith, you can talk a bit about how uh, the what the, the song chord mode is in the movie and what it represents. So the song chords, um, they're featured pretty prominently in the second movie. Um, you see Nate Terry with them. But basically each Navi 
as a song chord, which represents uh, aspects of their life. Um, each thing on the song chord is a reminder. And uh, so with that, they are like, okay, well, we can represent, you know, we want to have, you know, modes, scenes from a uh, bunch of major things in the movie. Um, we wound up coming, it, it wasn't my intention to go this high at first, but we wound up with 11 scenes from the first movie and 11 scenes from the second movie. So there's 22 song chord modes in total. And to get those, um, they're like each, each shot on the play field represents an area that might be related to each of the song chord memories. So once you get the requisite um, tokens for a certain mode, then you can play that mode. And uh, so that's how you enable song chord modes and um, start them, you play them. So it's just a, it, it was just a, it was a, you know, when you do a license, you want to try and bring in as much of the, the movie as you can or the license as you can. So to us, it just made sense to represent the modes via the song chords. And then they let us come up with this uh, token thing to get to the point where we did the song chords. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's basically the genesis of it. Yeah. So I have to translate all of that into <laughs> into this into the UI and 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 trying to understand what he um, what you know uh, translate into the screen. So I start off in uh, Illustrator uh, Vector Program and do a like a sketch a layout and no idea what what what's gonna be where, but I do wanna we do wanna find out uh, what what what's most important to show. Um, and we, for this case, in this case, it was pretty clear that the licensor and the, and the entire movie is all natural, so no straight lines uh, in in Pandora. And so we we came up with a UI that is not as symmetrical as you're used to uh, in our games. And so we offset the score area, and then you know I just put some stuff around until you are in a next next iteration you get more ideas um, and you you're I'm not sure if I presented these sketches to to Lightstorm and Disney yeah I guess in, in a yeah, real yeah. early stage it yeah and 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 then you hope that they understand that this is not the final UI <laughs> right um, uh, so they start asking for yeah visuals, but yeah, you don't want to get too far in your uh, your work because you know things are going to change along the way. Um, so I so you present something with an image in the background. Here we start adding the song chord uh, more as a divider across the uh, across the screen, and um, Keith had this idea of the the tokens separate from the court and then you shoot the shots and they get to the court and it that changed along the way and um, was the pointer also yeah so up here we had this idea for uh, the progress for qualifying multiple uh, movie one and uh, up here uh, down here the qualifying for uh, movie two multiball and so you do different sketches and ideas uh, colors. Uh, they uh, Lightstorm didn't like the, the skin, uh, using the skin as a pattern um, in in on the screen. Um, but this uh, this is one of the latest or the pre pre final uh, where we where I actually also uh, found out. Okay, let's let's present the movie as big as possible and um, have the rule UI sort of scattered around in a natural way um, and make, you know, uh, ha be, so the, 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 the movie itself is the, the star of this, of, of the show. Uh, you, we have this fantastic footage and you, we need to show it. So um, that's, that's um, and I sort of, uh, I really liked what we did on, on Guns N' Roses. Once you start a song, you have the full screen video 
um, <coughs> and um, yeah, was able to do this on this game. Um, so this is the final uh, rendering where we, you know, you see how how it how it ends up. Um, uh, what can I say about this? So we also tried with the beats uh, that they sort of represent um, what what. Uh, so each beat is a part of uh, is a, a scene in the movie, and so some beats are specific to a scene like this this uh, um, claw um, thing. Uh, challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never heard of it, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the mode um, where um, Jake oh, um, oh. Uh, gets his uh, uh, banshee, yeah, the banshee yeah, yeah. Yeah. and here is more choral related. And in the movie two is more underwater, so we have more choral uh, uh, beats. Um, okay, so here's uh, some renders Olaf create, uh, created. These are um, okay. So this is an interesting. Um, the, um, the licensor, um, we've, it's really hard to add your own um, objects or um, like game elements to the movie because they, they don't want uh, us to create our own, to create little side uh, stories or elements which don't exist in the movies, um, which uh, can be hard. But so at one point, um, we, we came up with these tokens that re represent the shots in the game. And so these are, uh, 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 diff we tried different materials and presented to them and so they could pick. And um, so we came up with these wooden tokens as if they were created in on Pandora, carved by the Navi. And they, they really liked that. And they actually had, so for a, uh, I think, a, uh, um, done something like that, but it's not in the movie, but done something in a, in a theme park or, uh, yeah. And so we, we were able to create our own tokens and they, they love them. They, they, so Olaf did a great job, um, uh, modeling them and, um, and, and making them look as if they were made. And, and these were still previous, um, the ones you see in the game are the final ones, obviously, but, um, um, how do we? Yeah, so here is the first like co the concept tokens of what what each uh, shot should represent, and here, here you see some um, like inspiration you you look for and 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 um, like mini wooden figures. Um, this is an, uh, a skill shot that did not get approved. Um, Also, because this is something that would not exist on Pandora. You try to make it look like it um, exists on Pandora. So this is a concept previous, um, but they, no, they, 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 it, it, it was not uh, allowed. Wasn't this the Mac screen? Yeah, this oh, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, this is the Mac. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, the, the, Navi, the Navi don't use numbers, so that's I why know. we have a um, different match screen where. Uh, instead of showing a number that matches your score, the uh, the wood sprites come down and choose the player that gets the match, or it, they just fly away if you don't get the match. So I think there we go. Here's the final one. So similar to pirates, where you 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 have a different match and it doesn't necessarily match the number and. Um, the only downside is that only one player can get a match, right? So, um, but yeah, it's it's a choice you make. Uh, I think that's it. That is yeah. It. Uh, let's see. Can I? Yeah. So that's my uh, song. So I'll pass this over to Grant Henry, who did audio for the game. I'm just going to sit back. Does this work for two? Hold on. Wait, I don't know. Ch check. We're great. We're great. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Grant. I go by uh, Stemage when music is involved. Um, for anyone that played the game today, you know, in that big room, 
maybe you couldn't tell there was music in the machine, but I promise you there is. I, I saw some people with earbuds today. I don't know if any, those are any of you, but bless you. Uh, there you go. Yeah, the jack is there for a reason. Um, yeah, so uh, James Horner music, the late, great James Horner. It's a big, having to write music that exists in the world that he made, is a, it's a big lift. Um, I, the way I sort of got started with it was we, we needed to set sort of a baseline for what the game would sound like. And then it needed to belong in Pandora, and then we could figure out how weird we wanted to get from there. So I spent time recreating, uh, becoming one of the people from the soundtrack to the note, by ear, every heart pluck, the mix, everything sounding exactly like the original as sort of a starting point. That became my template. And then we could just sort of move on from there. Um, we obviously had a list of all of the different scenes and all the different modes we needed to incorporate. And my main goal was just to, to create music that felt like it belonged in that world, incorporate as, as many of uh, Horner's themes as possible, and create music that you know, I would consider to be interesting but not distracting and not something that would get old, which can be difficult to do. Um, so really it was, just, it was just trial and error with different modes and uh, we obviously need to run everything by Lightstorm and Disney, um, which I was very nervous about because I've done some projects working with pre-existing IP and it's been an absolute nightmare. Uh, but Lightstorm and Disney were awesome. Uh, we were on the right track. They would say, keep going, but uh, South American wins. You know, okay, South American wins. Um, you know, they had specific requests for vocalizations. They talked about they had a person they would send me to that was sort of the avatar music guy. He was like, he's the one that reviewed everything for uh, Frontiers of Pandora, the video game that came out a while ago. And he would talk about certain chord progressions that might make sense for certain things, uh, given the context. So they were super supportive uh, and really easy to work with. So that was, that's good. That's, that's a good start. Um, and then I had this idea for multiball where I'm, I'm kind of a rock guy, and I just had this vision of a European symphonic me metal band within Temptation doing a covering music from Avatar. What, what would that sound like, right, in my head? I'm like, I don't know. This isn't, this isn't going to work. Maybe it will. So I just I, I wrote a piece that made sense for multiball. Um, and if this wasn't going to work, it's fine. I could have could have backpedaled. But I wrote a piece. I sort of pushed in some textures some guitar textures, nothing heavy, nothing crazy, but just a bit of sizzle. I, instead of doing the thunder drums, I put a trap kit in there and sort of made a song out of it and sent it to Mark. And Mark's a metalhead, so he's fine with it. <laughs> so we sort of made the case to, um, to, to Lightstorm and Disney. So this is what we're doing. This is sort of our take on Pandora. And I wanted Multiball to, you know, I wanted it to be like war, like when you beat that crab and you hear the first hit and the choir comes in, I wanted it to be, I wanted to disarm the player. Um, and they listened to it and they gave the thumbs up and were like, keep going. I'm like, all right, okay, well, we're doing this. So the multi-ball music is amped a bit, but it does, I, in my opinion, musically, it certainly fits in that universe. Um, and I think it rocks. So hope you guys enjoy that. Um, for sound, uh, sound design, I'm a big fan of the solid state era. I love 80s machines. I love the Williams chips. I love the Gottlieb FM chips. That's just my favorite thing in the world. And I was playing around with those kinds of voicings for the game, and it, it just didn't quite fit because it's Avatar. It doesn't quite fit. But there's a lot of that in there. I, I love video games, and I love the sounds from those machines, even for new pinball players, are immediately nostalgic, just hearing bits of that. So there are bits of that everywhere. There's a bit of space in the game. There's a lot of weird uneasiness uh, out in the woods and underwater and some fun little synth flourishes and things like that that I kind of peppered in there that didn't, didn't sort of, didn't feel like it belonged. Um, so, and yeah, and I just gotta give a shout out to the development team. So. Keith, Jason, Taylor, my heroes. I come from the game dev space where we have fancy middleware that we can do all kinds of transitions and quantization and layers and all this stuff. And I had like all these ideas about, um, I don't like how music, when it changes in a pinball machine to an, another song immediately, there's this scene, you can hear it. A song stops and a song starts and it's weird. So I made this cymbal swell and was like, 
Taylor, can you start this swell, you know, 100 milliseconds before the song, you know, changes over? And so the swell covers the transition, things like that, just to kind of make it feel more organic. Um, I had the idea to have modes that all the song chord modes have three layers of music. So it starts at sort of a more peaceful level. And then as you score points in the mode, another version of that song sort of comes in. So the, the music builds over the course of the mode. Um, and they all helped with that stuff, and it was amazing. Uh, thank you for the lifts, guys. But um, yeah, that's sort of the story of the sound of this game, and it was a lot of fun to work on. So. I don't know if uh, Olaf has anything he wants to talk about, or no? No? Yeah? Yeah, the crab. The crab. Yes, <laughs> the crab. Red alerts. <laughs> no. Oh, the plop cup. Where's the plop? The plop cup. Well, there's no wind, so uh, we're good. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. Uh, when I, uh, it all started, uh, Jean Paul uh, started uh, on Avatar, and I was still working on Elton. And when I uh, finished Elton, I helped uh, uh, and supported uh, Jean-Paul, basically. So, uh, yeah, I, I worked on several elements, uh, like uh, the beats, uh, the wooden tokens, and um, the multiballs. Uh, yeah, I'm a bit of a yeah. breath. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah. mo mo ma mainly the 3D stuff, because yeah. uh, I sort of got out of, 3D modeling and animation, and Olaf is yeah. just better in that. And so it's great to have him aboard. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I work from a studio in Amsterdam, and next to me is uh, Lars. He's uh, also very good in 3D and technical. So uh, we got very detailed uh, 3D models, uh, and, and but it is just a model. And before you start animating it, it needs to be rigged, it needs to be prepared for animation. Um, so yeah, that's basically what we did and, and started from there. And then the crea creative process uh, starts again. Uh, so yeah, uh, w I talked with Jason. Jason and I, were, we were collaborating on, uh, on the crab suit battle and we had lots of fun uh, <laughs> with that. Uh, and and luckily we got the create uh, the freedom to uh, you know to do something with that uh, like uh, this playful game of uh, you know beating the crap and when you lose he laughs at you and and, and does that dance so yeah that is <laughs> that is uh, it's it's really great that it's it was possible and uh, and and to do that and. And, and give them bubbles and, and things. So, so I, I really enjoyed uh, creating that, uh, I, I must say. So um, yeah, and I think it turned out really well, uh, uh, sending over 3D animations to uh, Jean-Paul, and then he took, took that on and, 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 and polished it even further and, and put it in the, in the UI. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with, with everything, uh, how it looks, how it sounds, and yeah, so um, I'm, I'm very uh, humble and happy that I was uh, able to work on this project, so yeah. And uh, I don't know, uh, is there anybody else that wants to say something? Or does Keith have anything to add? Or Keith, you... Um, you know, I don't have a whole lot to add. I, you know, we did, we did something a little bit different on the game in terms of modes, so we have the song chords that you talked about earlier, uh, which, uh, you know, some people will kind of think of The Hobbit in terms of how you qualify them and stuff. Um, but then we also have the Savako modes in the game, which is more your typical shoot a shot three times and start a mode that way. And just because, you know, we didn't, I don't know, I think it would have been hard to come up with the rule for the ramps and stuff like that, but, but there was enough material that we had access to. We basically have access to anything that doesn't involve humans in the movies. So that's, that's a lot of footage that we can use. Plus, then we got the rights to some humans as well, such as uh, Sam Worthington. Um, uh, Sam Worthington. 
Sigourney Weaver. That's yeah, that's what I was thinking about. No, Sigourney Weaver. Yeah. Um, the boat captain. Um, a couple other people, and uh, so there's there's definitely some human use of spider, and uh, so we have a lot of footage that we can use. So you know we had we had things we could work with to put even more. You know, 22 modes wasn't enough, so we came up with eight more modes, and then two multi balls, which use a ton of footage. Um. And then, you know, we get all that stuff in there, and we're just playing the game, and it still feels like there's not enough. So we come up with the the Mayuya rule, which is kind of just like a currency that you collect as you go through the game. Um, it started off as like a bonus for completing the Savaka modes, but then it just didn't feel like didn't feel like it was fun enough, so uh, you would just put it in through the whole game. Um, yeah, so... There, you know, there's a lot to do. It's a very, it's a very broad game, um, which means you know there's there's a lot that you have access to, a lot of varied content that you have access to at pretty much all times. Um, and then the uh, Pandora wizard mode and the ICU wizard mode. So they, uh, it's it's not it's not as you know maybe multi layered as some other games, but I think the depth will be enough for most people and hopefully the breadth of the game, you know, keeps people interested for a long time as well. Anybody else like to say anything? Or I think that was the entire team that that wanted to say something. So um is there anything? She's good. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think we have much else. To, do we have time for questions or? Yeah, all right. All right. Who's got questions? Oh, lucky. Mark, just real quick, because you come from homebrew and everything, can you go ahead and just speak on your experience between being solely in charge of your project, of your dream machine, and then transitioning over into a company structure and the different changes and the different liberties that you get within that space? That, that's a great question, actually. Uh, no. <laughs> um, so it's, it's way better to have a team. Like, <laughs> it's, I, I don't want to come up with all the stuff by myself. Like, um, it's uh, it, like just having so many other people to, uh, come with the great ideas and um, tell you when your ideas are dumb. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's so much better um, working with a team than working by yourself. Um, this is a way better game than my homebrew end up being. So yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, so. Now that the game is out and you've seen people play it, uh, is there anything that you've kind of seen and learned and, and uh, taken as, okay, maybe I need to tweak some things? Or uh, I'm just curious, any of those that, that you've seen? I think I heard something about uh, Carl's uh, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, perpetual he know, breaks, ball. He breaks yeah, things. He breaks every game yes. yeah, from there. I'm, I'm just curious. It looks like, you know, from, from playing in, you know, on location to now, like the pop bumper in the lower play field, mm -hmm. I haven't not one stuck ball and i've been in that line over and over and over today uh of playing it so whatever you guys have done is uh is is working well um no we we definitely we're paying attention yeah <laughs> uh, keith could probably talk a little more yeah about this. i mean I'll, I'll i maybe let jason tell the long sordid tale of you know <laughs> dealing with the yeah. bottom play fields but uh yeah as far as tweaking and stuff so we released the game when we did with uh, i think it was 0.93 software um we kept putting off and putting off and putting off a release set so a lot has changed since you know we did i mean it's been like what a month or something um so if you play it now it's vastly different than than what we started off as and for the better and and we knew that there would be tweaks um it's uh you know it's inevitable it's i i, I won't go too much on the details but um it wound up being a pretty hard game to balance. I think that the 
the play field kind of really um let's just say it, the gulf between bad players and good players is maybe a little bit more evident on this play field than some other play fields um so trying to get the right balance for you know casual players versus expert players um is definitely a bit of a challenge um it's much better now and i guarantee you that i'll be pouring over the audits um after expo to see you know what people are actually doing in the game and stuff like that but it's way more balanced now than it was you know when we first released it and uh, i think it plays a lot better now for sure so definitely and i don't know if jason wants to say anything about the play field or not but Right, so uh, early on when I started working on the game, I really liked just playing around with the little flippers on the, the play field, and there, there wasn't really any rules or code for it yet. And so I just said, hey, I, I like this. I want to do something with this. And so I ended up doing um, that, both of the play fields in the game. And um, there's been 10 Jersey Jack machines. This is the first one that has lower play fields well it has uh you first want to have a lower play field let alone two um i'm expecting this might be we might take a break from lower play fields for a while after this i i have spent hours of my life um uh, getting those things to work and even since that release that 093 release went back through everything just to make it absolutely bulletproof because there were some differences between whitewood prototypes and production games and it's just getting it to be able to work in every variation every scenario so i think it's pretty good now but um yeah it was just something that we'd never done before so there was just a lot to really account for and this is also the first seven ball game uh that jjp's ever done because that little ball is the seventh ball in addition to the six pick balls that are in the trough so um and initially, the uh, Mark's idea for the, the pop bumper was it was going to be player controlled. And so I coded it up that way, and uh, it was really abstract. You know, it was really difficult to get the timing right. So then it evolved from there and some just suggestions from Keith to make it kind of more like a lane change thing. And it just kind of kept growing and evolving. And then I've had a lot of people make comments about the crab, fighting the crab. Um, the third level of difficulty for the crab was originally the first level of difficulty. And, and the story behind that is um, we were playing it in the office and it was just that was kind of like what I thought was fun. And Keith kind of really had to reel me in on that because he's like, no, 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 you can't make it that difficult. But I'm like, this is really fun. And so there's, we had to, I had to really dial it back just because, you know, uh, I just didn't have the sense of, of, of all the different spectrum of players that he does and, and all his experience. So my inexperience really showed itself. And, and I think it's, I think it, we ended up in a good spot, but yeah, there's, there's multiple layers of difficulty to that crab. So if you get to the third crab, that's the way it was originally. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, so first of all, my compliments, this is a stunning game. I mean, truly a stunning game. Um, my question is kind of goes along with what you guys were just talking about. I understand there's supposed to be like two or three more Avatar movies coming out. Um, and I know JJP is really good about putting out pretty complete codes when you put the games out as opposed to other companies. Uh, but my question is, and I mean, I don't even know if this is even on the thought process, but as more movies come out, is there any thought about maybe having some code down the road that would tie in new movies as they come out to make it still keep it contemporary with the uh, releases or something like that? I, I, I like the way this microphone thing works. <laughs> Uh, we never say never, so you never know. That's the answer. I will say one thing in that, though. I mean, just keep in mind that um, after the game is out and, you know, you ask for more stuff from different movies, I mean, that's that's a lot of labor between, you know, 
JP, possibly Olaf, possibly, you know, me or Jason or Taylor. Um, and and so that would probably have to be monetized somehow. And, you know, I, I don't know how likely any of that is. Uh, this is a silly question, but uh, probably well, it's been on my mind, but I don't know if it's in the game already or if it's not in the game. But is there a way, since the Navi do speak their own language, could you change all the language on the pinball machine to uh, to have the Navi language? We could, <laughs> but... <laughs> well, well, here's here's the thing about that, too. So, you know, as as we were going through looking for some Navi words for some features, like like when you were trying to come up with something for the currency, you know, we wound up with Mayuya, which means honor. Um, but... You know, there are a couple other things in the running. There's something for strength and something for wisdom, I think it was. Yeah. And uh, they're kind of like, let us choose. So, you know, they, they, so we won't have Mayuya. Um, yeah. there, there's not a significant full translation of all of English yet. Mm -hmm. Like, they kind of are just making the words they need as they go along. So I would rate Navi as a pretty incomplete language right now as opposed to something that's like you know a J.R.R. Tolkien would have done you know what I mean so probably not okay this one might be for either Mark or Jack uh, it's inspired by the licensing discussion earlier today is is there anything that you're able to do to help the uh, either the movie uh, team or anyone in the world of Avatar publicize the fact that this machine exists? Is there anything they will do for you to support the idea that the game is out there? Um, the, uh, so the um, trailer was shared on the official Avatar channel. Um, McFarland Toys, who have a couple sculpts in the games, they also helped share um, stuff for uh, our trailer. Um, who else? There's, uh, there was a lot. There's a lot going on. There's, there's stuff that hasn't happened yet that, that, that I think are in the works. So, um, yeah, they've been great. Them, I think they've been one of the best for helping promote uh, out of all the Jersey Jack games. Um, they've been phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all um i just want to say again very publicly how proud i am of you specifically mark um having been around since the very beginning of your journey a couple of late nights on twitch with literally no one else in the chat except me and you <laughs> um the first time i saw you at one of these seminars i asked you how it felt differently to be part of a team instead of doing everything yourself the second year i asked you how it felt to be a mentor to steve ritchie and oh yeah we got some good answers yeah. that year <laughs> um and so now that you've finally completed your first journey full circle i'm going to ask you again the same continuing line of questioning how do you feel differently now than you did before you started in your basement alone on Twitch with me heckling you all night. That hasn't changed, but no. No. <laughs> now that you've done the entire journey, you earned your spot up there. You belong where you are, no matter what your brain tells you. That's it right there. I, I actually feel like a game designer now. Yeah, that is exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you for saying just that. Congratulations, Mark. And and with that, with that, we're gonna say thank you and good night. We appreciate everything. Go out and play Avatar in the room, and we'll catch all of you guys later. Thank you.